So I'm Stephen Polyakov. I wrote and directed Glorious 39, and I'm here with... Romola Gary. Hello. And um, we are watching the these interminable, as all films have now, <laughs> um, <laughs> logos of the various people that paid for the film. Um, uh, but it was all completely British finance, which is unusual um, for movies now. And that was great because it enabled us to um, very much make the movie that we set out to make. These opening moments um, are sh shot in Norfolk and the whole movie, um, everything that's meant to be Norfolk is in Norfolk and everything that's in London is in London. Um, but it was um, not this glorious pink um, evening, was it, Romola? It was um, an extremely um, grey day. Yeah, the um, pretty much any... Uh, exterior in this film is about 60 or 70 percent warmer and nicer looking than it actually was um, um it was it was it will be returning to the, the the wrong seasons but it was shot in november december and the story is shot shot in uh, is set in august and september so that required a considerable degree of of acting you know, of acting <laughs> and um and um, nifty um, sleight of hand. Um, this opening sequence around the Abbey, we'll return to the Abbey later in the film, this extraordinary location, um, Castle Acre in Norfolk, is a sort of flash forward. It is the dream that she has at the um, when she's locked up at the end of the film. Um, and here we see um, the, the, the joyful moments of her siblings, what is betrayed in the story, and then this disquieting image. Um, it's like that all the the darkness and the lightness um, are muddled together in her in her dream, the closeness of her siblings and the darkness that she uncovers. And then we return to the present or, or, or start in the present. Um, I, um, a lot of people have done a lot of Q and A's for this movie. Have asked why it starts and ends in the in the present, and it's. One of the reasons is for a modern audience that we realize quite how recent these events are to us. They're still within living memory. Um, this seemed to be incredibly important, for, especially for a younger audience. Um, like this young man here, um, playing Michael Toby Rigbo, who at the moment is playing um, the young... Um, Dumbledore in Harry Potter, Michael Gambon, younger Michael Gambon, um, and um, has made several movies already. He's an extraordinarily interesting young actor. Um, and here he approaches this house um, with the um, incredible um, jigsaw that filmmaking is. This is in the, literally next to St. Paul's. In, um, and then we go into an interior, this rather magical interior, which is... Um, somewhere else, as in most movies, in, but it's still in um, in London. It's in Stepney, and we're about to meet a legend. Um, sadly, you had no scenes with Christopher Lee, but uh, did you, Romola? But no, uh, I, I I did get to meet him though, which yeah. is quite exciting. Um, it was great to have two legends Brit of British cinema in this movie, Julie Christie and um, Christopher Lee and um, the wonderful Corin Redgrave as his younger brother um, in this room. The uneasy sense of the past never letting go of these two old men, um, like they're trapped forever into the story that they haven't been able to get away from the past. Um, and um, it was um, interesting because um, they're both obviously um, quite um, senior actors now and um, it was quite a lot of dialogue for them to shoot in two days I found myself being quite strict with them towards the end you know shall I go through the lines with you one by one I was sort of like a schoolmaster <laughs> um, to do that with Christopher Lee who has made more movies than any other living actor uh, nearly 300 movies um, he's in the Guinness Book of Records he is the most most movies of any actor of any nationality, um, which is fairly extraordinary. Um, and 
already you are haunting this there you are um this the the story even though you have not said a line yet um that we know it revolves around you um that something's wrong something happened that separates you from this happy sense of the siblings um obviously since you're not in the story you never ever thought about the present did you um it's as if it never happened because um or did you well i think at the at the end of the film you have to consider how to play the final scenes of the film um and um they obviously had uh, had a bearing on <clears throat> on on what her legacy would have meant for uh, Christopher Lee's character and Corin Redgrave's character, how their their memory of her would have been shaped by how she responds to the conflicts at the end of the film. Um, so yeah, I did I did think about it and um, and 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 as you say, because the 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 film makes it very clear that these are contemporary issues, which you know certainly the case for I know my family and your family, Stephen, <laughs> and so. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I did think about it. These shots um, were done um, just before we started shooting and the leaves were, had magically not dropped in October and we were very lucky this sunny day. So it looks a balmy summer, um, especially this shot. Um, it was the few weeks just before the war broke out was an extraordinarily sort of late Indian summer, beautiful. Um, everybody that was alive then remembers it as such, and that war broke out in this balmy time. Um, hence the title, which is also a play on words um, on um, her nickname, Glorious. And here we plunge into November, but um, there was about five minutes of sun this day, and we were ran through the sun, the steady cam shot. I, this shot's shooting towards the past and bringing it forward, so you, you're hurtled into the past. Um, and the heady, um, carefree moments when... Um, and it's um, just concerned with her dad's birthday and um, the excitement of having her lover there um, with um, the eccentric Hector, played by David Tennant. Um, and um, it will be a theme. We'll try to keep it short of the commentary of quite how cold you were all the time. But we can, we can now start the commentary of the panoply of gorgeous men in the yes. film <laughs> since we have the array of... David Tennant, Eddie Redmayne and Charlie Cox all in this scene together. And indeed, um, the, um, the extremely talented and vibrant Juno is Temple as well. Yeah, we, it was very exciting to have such a, a great collection of young actors, all of them um, have a lot of movies between them already, um, with um, the legends as well and, and with Bill in the middle. It, that was a very potent, um, a very potent... Is that the cat that attacked you? Um, I am slightly confused because we've got two hairy cats um, <laughs> and we will get to the disaster of the cats in a moment. Um, the, um, um, this was, um, as you can see, that the, the, the light um, is closing in um, and, um, but um, it does get cloudy and then sunny again because we're about to go into a glorious sunny um, evening which is all meant to be the same day. There were about 50 people on the set, various press and things during while we were shooting this, which is um, always a bad idea because they're very distracting. <laughs> and um, um, it's always, I always think that's probably the worst sequence. Um, the um, This amazing Abbey here we see, it, um, I, it's only been filmed in for one afternoon of the whole history of British filmmaking. Um, and... Um, it is one one of the best locations I've ever found. I think it is extraordinary because it's both a ruin, but also some of it is is, is still there. And once again, there was about an hour and a half of sun, um, and we had a lot of rain in this abbey. There, you can see beyond the arches how that's still got a roof and there's still a, a part of the old abbey remains. So it is an absolutely extraordinary location, um, and. Um, that um, again, the carefree. We were very, very lucky. There's a close-up of you that was very difficult to cut into the sequence, um, but is one of the nicest close-up there. Isn't that a fantastic backlit by God? <laughs> Don't quite know uh, what you expect me to say. To that. <laughs> well, I see. Yes, is what I expect you to say. Um, that we had this lovely um, 
late afternoon sun for literally about 55 minutes and as you can see there are a lot of shots here and a lot of characters and the RAF um, were all American Air Force both which bombarded us through this shoot anybody that knows North Norfolk knows that air, low flying warplanes are um, almost as common as sound as wood pigeons and um, that was bombarding us so here's Bill's nice entry to the film it's the third third drama film that I made with Bill. I made Lost Prince and also Gideon's Daughter, for which he won the Golden Globe and was fabulous in. And um, there is um, underneath the charm of this, of this character, uh, the moment you think he's an usual charming Bill character, um, and gradually we begin to feel there may be more to him. Also in this scene is the extremely talented Jeremy Northam, well known for playing sinister characters. This was extremely useful. I normally don't like casting um, straight on the nose but because Jeremy's played a lot of villains, but it is very useful in the story because you need a dark force so that um, you are like Anne, you think um, he must be the sole responsibility, Secret Service, and um, you don't suspect um, people closer to the family. So now we come to the scene... Um, what well, people won't know, of course, is that we all are wearing sleeping bags. Uh, well, <laughs> under the electric table. electric blankets, I think. Yeah, and sleeping bags. <laughs> um, it's actually it was quite balmy with all that. I think you were warmer for once, warmer than me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the this was done in late November. This scene, and um, I think the candles um, furiously blowing are a slight giveaway that there is an icy northern wind blowing. I think probably and nearly everything in this story, um, the historical detail is true, but I pro feel this is probably the only al fresco meal ever held in North Norfolk, <laughs> His, um, because it is one of the coldest places in Britain. Even in high summer, it might be quite a risk. But it was great to be able to sh shoot it outside, because with... If there's one thing that I'm really, really proud of in this scene, is, is that we all look like we're having a lovely, warm... Summer nights in the garden. Yes, um, um, within uh, twenty-four hours or forty-eight hours of shooting the scene, this app, this location, and this grass was six inches deep in snow. It's absolutely true, and the trucks had to struggle to get out of Norfolk. It was right at the end of the shoot, so we were extremely lucky. Um, the snow was coming, but it hadn't quite arrived. Um, it was also quite scary because um, your um, dialogue, Stephen, as you know, which is amazing to play, and is, but is often, you know, quite wordy, you know, especially for sort of contemporary dialogue, and we'd all, you know, struggling to get our lines every day, and then David Tennant turns up for one day of filming, has a huge speech which he knows word perfectly, and does about 15 times, and never needs to do a retake, and never, ever stops, mm. or has, it was um, sort of embarrassing silence afterwards as me and Eddie and Juno looked at each other and thought oh no we're really gonna have to know our lines well yes I mean I think that you um um slightly undersell yourself um as normal that you were very good on your lines too but nevertheless yes David um, I mean obviously he had more than what this was his big scene which was shot in one night um but obviously he's uh, he was on the film for about five days but um he was playing Hamlet at the time and so um he was rushing from Stratford, no, not on the same night as he was playing Hamlet, but he was rushing from um, the stage um, and having given his Dane and then playing um, Hector, and that was a big scene. And also the American Air Force was bombarding us for about two hours um, during that, just as we were um, preparing that scene, which was also deafening and extraordinary in the middle of nowhere. I think we should talk about this extraordinary arch, this, that, um, that this is in... Um, Little Walsingham, which is in North Norfolk, um, a place of pilgrimage because of a saint that was um, is, um, a story of... of it's, a, it's a high Anglican sort of place of pilgrimage. Um, and that is the little bit of the abbey that's left, the original abbey next to this house. It's all a private house. Um, it's never been filmed in before. Um, it's a very, very potent location with a sense of history in it. Um, well, I think we should also have a word for the costumes in this as well yeah, because this is such a beautiful dress and 
and he is such a brilliant, brilliant yes, designer. Yes, Annie, <laughs> Annie Simons, who's just the fifth show I've done with her, and she is a, she made Emily Blunt look absolutely stunning. Um, um, well, that's not a, hard, but... <laughs> a, a Golden Globe winner, as she contributed to Emily's Golden Globe with some fabulous dresses and Gideon's daughter. And, um, um, the, yeah, she's done a lot of shows with me. Um um, so this is the moment of connection between um, we, we've just seen her say goodbye to her lover Charlie Cox and she's a, the connection with Bill this was a very central thing wasn't it the the, the fact that they were so close yeah um, I think her it was something we talked a lot about in, in rehearsals was that because she's adopted um her status in the family is a precarious one um and and it was very interesting to kind of explore those those issues of of at the one time on on the one hand being a sort of a special gift to the parents an extra special gift because she came at a time when they thought they couldn't have children and then and then that status is is taken away from her when she becomes a problem she she um becomes less the special child and uh, and more a sort of problematic one. Um, it was it was really interesting to explore that kind of that journey with with Bill. Um, but it's established very strongly that she is the favoured child mm. at the beginning. And and the sort of head. This push. was the mad cat. That was this was the mad. <laughs> yes, this was um, this was um, very very difficult. I think it was the smoke. There's a little bit of smoke in the air, um, and um, this cat. Um, I like cats, and I um, very stupidly um, said, "Oh, I, I'll relax." It. I picked it up and made a fuss about it, and the cat cat smashed me in the face, sort of boxed me with both paws he was so cross and <laughs> that really taught me um um but anyway he um calmed down um for, for future scenes so the moment of the uncovering of records um a key thing in the plot um the only way for them to record things in those days um, um they didn't have um tape they didn't have recording machines tape recorders they they had to do it um on records um and that's what this is true um and so hence um it could look like a convincing dance record and that's what she thinks she's found her favorite moment we skipped over jenny there jenny agato who um was in a play of mine 25 years ago and it was great to have her such an iconic figure of my youth the railway children etc um in playing such a small role um we'll come back to her in a, in a moment um the breakfast scene was our first scene um with all of us together wasn't it, it was bill's first scene um and yeah. um um originally we'd rehearsed it slightly differently but when i saw the which only closed caused a very minor upset. Oh, yes. <laughs> Rom and I had a Romula does an enormous too. amount of work beforehand and she, it's fair to say she doesn't like this change. This isn't at all what we had arranged. <laughs> doesn't like change. But I didn't believe they'd have a gramophone in, in the dining room, just but in the hallway they would have danced. Originally, it had been written so that they, they were in a, a sort of on the terrace and they could hear it through the, the sort of French windows, but the geography and the temperature didn't allow that to happen. But that's interesting, um, and um, we did do an enormous amount of rehearsal, didn't we, for, for this film? And yeah. I, I think that was incredibly useful, wasn't it? Because of Oh, absolutely. As, I mean, especially, uh, I think, with the relationships between um, Bill and myself and Juno and myself and, and Eddie and Juno and Bill, uh, the, the family dynamic, because none of it is played out verbally you, you know the whole sort of subtext of the family isn't revealed till right at the end of, of the story nobody's really saying what they mean it was very important to just establish what people were thinking about each other so that we had some you know correct intentions to play um so the rehearsal process was incredibly useful and and i hope that you can see that that work in that you know i hope it looks like you know that. i think that um the story what um Consistency of performance through through the film is, is is due to. I always do a lot of rehearsal, but I mean, especially with this one, with the hurly burly of shooting um, in winter when it was dark by four o'clock, it, it was quite incredible discipline from everybody to get as elaborate film as this shot in that time. So now the only um, love scene in the film, um, for once, it's the man that takes his clothes off. Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and um, this was actually shot um, without um, anybody um, causing any problems, including the cat. The cat was very good. Um, it had to sit, that wide shot we just seen it has to sit um, still for quite a long time. Um, we had two cats, and I can't remember if this is the cat that beat me up, but um, I do remember. It was rem- certainly quite happy to sit and watch. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, and um, Charlie's, um, everybody, well, well, a lot of people remember him from playing the lead in Stardust, was um, is, is, is a delightful actor, extremely good actor, and um, very... Um, One of the most charming men yeah. <laughs> in the world. <laughs> And here is the, uh, Julie's first appearance, um, and um, uh, it was, um, again, um, Julie is very choosy about what she does, and it was incredibly exciting to have her play um, this role, which is not a huge role, but incredibly pivotal, and um, also a character role that I can't really remember her playing um, a part that is sort of waspish and, and, and slightly comic and slightly sinister like this before I think it was a real um, change of direction for her after such an extraordinary career and shows what a range she's got which most people mm. um, She was always sort of so so famous for having a kind of emotional openness and vulnerability mm. and it's certainly the first time I ever have experienced her playing somebody who has such a strong mm. ag- agenda and is so hidden emotionally hidden and um, it was it was extraordinary to work with her. Mm. That's right, and it's, it's also quite frightening. I don't remember Judy being that, you know, as you say, she's usually open and likeable in films. Um, so here we were in the depth of winter. Um, we managed to put a few leaves back on trees. Um, uh, it's, he looks very vulnerable in his tiny car. <laughs> it does he, look really weirdly he, he, small. Evil, there's... Um, and um, there's... Again, um, that was obviously a shot at day, and the the lovely close-ups of it was shot at night. So um, that was great skill of um, of Danny Cohen, the DOP, um, who I worked with a lot before. Incredibly Amazing cinematographer. Yeah, gifted guy. Um, well, we had to do a lot of that cheating um, because of the light. So this is rather haunting because we are in. Ealing Studios, um, the famous Ealing Studios, which um, for their comedies and for their famous war films, um, which they made after the war, what um, charting the heroic fight that we did against the Nazis, what very different movies would have emerged from this studio if if, um, the people that wanted to do a deal with Hitler had done and would become a puppet state of the Nazis. It's quite extraordinary to think the familiar Ealing Studios would have had swastikas all over it, been making films about... um, um, the evil Jews. Um, it was very, very haunting and for me. Neither Stephen or I would have been <laughs> neither, <laughs> yes. starring in those. <laughs> um, it was very haunting to be on the, in the same space as they made those movies. And this is the passage. Um, one of the the passages are still in their original state. Some of them. And um, um, here she hears the news on where the, the the death of David Tennant's character Hector, the film changes gear we realize after that sort of carefree um opening and the very much establishing her position in the family and the family's position in this beautiful part of england with its traditions um suddenly her um her world changes her love is rushed off and there is the darkness of the death of somebody she's just seen um it was also quite strange for me because i spent the vast majority of of my limited career wearing corsets at Mm. work so it was a strange um kind of loop in time to be in a film set in the 30s wearing a costume from the 1850s (laughs) which is what my normal working day is like yes that's interesting and um hugh bonneville as um the friend gilbert the um old actor that old actor i should say i really Uh, love this shot because it's such a one of Stephen's great geniuses, if I can use that word, this early on in the commentary is, is the visual language of the film and that the, the policeman and the and the vicar playing the mm. state and the church playing football with the with the country. It's always something. Yeah, I poised, think about. yeah. The um, it was there are very few extras in this film. This was not just a monetary consideration. It was I wanted the film to 
to uh, to inha- be around the family, be around Annie. This is in fact one of the few scenes we see the family in relation to the outside world before um, Anne's uh, um, things turned really dark. And um, the, the, the ancient um, uh, traditions of the, uh, you know, of the family, the great family walks to church and uh, I'm not quite sure what they were doing on the street, standing around in the rain. This troubled me enormously um, when we were filming it, but I mean, it was meant to be that they were just going about their business and they stopped to take their hats off. But because it was raining, we weren't able, and time, we weren't able to stage it like that. But um, um, anyway. But I think it's quite good because mm. it's like, I mean, maybe it's a throwback to a slightly earlier mm. era where people would have stood mm. um, and, and watch. watched the family process to church in yes. that way. But anyway, um, certainly it's true that these families had this great position still in the country. And of course, in Norfolk especially, even now, there are a lot of these huge houses. A lot of, many of them very secret. You're not allowed to visit them. They're not open to the public. Dominated by um, um, great landowners. And of course, with its uh, closeness to Sandringham and the royals, it, it's a very establishment um, um, part of the country in terms of of those those great houses um the vicar the sinister vicar um i um was very um i'm always thinking um any story that's uh, um about what happened um with hitler and the um the, the, the catastrophe of, of the rise of the nazis of the attitude of the church um I think and you've made that quite clear with the um <laughs> the casting and um yes and um and how they would have reacted if we had become a puppet state and people had been carted off i mean as we know um the pope didn't exactly cover himself in glory during this time and um the church of england um which would have had some of the anti-Semitism that was rife amongst um, the upper classes, um, and not just the upper classes, but particularly strong among the upper classes, um, would not have been immune to that. Um, here's just thinking back to um, um, David's um, speech and his moment of... Uh, his, it's great. The great thing about the casting of David was that because he's such a vivid actor, you did, even though he's on screen for less than 10 minutes, that you really do care when he, he leaves the film and, and worry about what he happened and uh, happened to him. And so that's, I think, it was great to get him. Um, the um, um, moment of, of the more discussing... Um, um, it, it, who Jeremy Northam's character is is very important that the story that the audience is not ahead of Anne and I think that she asked the question that you sort of want you would have wanted to ask hey who was that man at that dinner and what is your connection to and she's sort of satisfied by the answers this this is the day that Julie Christie nearly froze to death on uh, your watch yes <laughs> 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 Romola was um <laughs> in this lovely yellow dress which didn't have much underneath and um yeah it was extraordinarily cold i have to say although um romla says i was striding about um in you just didn't a weren't even wearing a coat right. um but that was to encourage you um <laughs> to, into the idea that it was a balmy summer's day yeah i mean we were on a hill which um was probably not a brilliant idea because of the wind but it does give us some it does great, look beautiful uh, yes and uh, we had to um ADR um, post sync this um, scene um, because of the wind. So all the dialogue was. I try not to do that as much as possible, but um, as you can see, the wind is um, is going. But because we've been able to lay this sort of dreamy sound of of insects and things, and because it was sunny, I mean, uh, um, um, you do believe that it's a sort of late summer day, even though you can see the trees just beginning to go behind. In fact, because there's a lot of um, this tree that I didn't know existed called um, an evergreen oak. Those are evergreen oaks there. That that looks like high summer, but in fact it's it's mid-November. I think it's nice that the the wind, although at the time was incredibly <laughs> unpleasant, was was very useful for the scene because it gives the 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 landscape a dynamism, the movement in the trees, mm. and um, there's a sort of sense of change and. That something's not entirely right mm. in it already in the, in the scene, which I think is 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 powerful yes. and dramatic. And That's right. There's an unease, um, and um, the um, the erotic reverie, which um, um, 
is important because she's a tiny bit culpable, even though, of course, um, it's not her fault in any way the baby disappears. Um, but, um, you know, she does doze off for a moment and then... But it was Charlie Cox, so yes. people can probably forgive her. Yes, it was. <laughs> I'm glad I got that right. You found that easy to imagine. Um, the um, um, One of the, uh, the good... Um, choices I think that we made Danny and I made if I can put it like that was to shoot this sequence on this stock called Vivid aptly called Vivid one of my favourite words I'm always wanting things to be Vivid that gives this ping this yellow dress pings almost like um, 50s or, or, or Technicolor or even earlier which gives it this rather lovely um, slightly heightened dimension just there you can see that it's a relatively new film stock needs an enormous amount of light so it's not very good in interiors. It was an extraordinary bold mm. choice of Annie's as well because she had terrible trouble <laughs> convincing me that that uh, you know a color I could wear a color like that mm. um because I'm a blonde and I wouldn't normally wear um uh, a color as bright as that and uh, you know when I saw it I just thought she's she's a brilliant woman because this of course the um sense that everything that's happening around her is real or, 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 or unreal is heightened by this kind of very, very strong colour that that um that the character Dan is wearing and, and it looks very, very powerful. Yes, I think that um it was it was a a bold choice and um especially with a lot of green around it was that was a daring idea. Normally you wouldn't put yellow and green like that together. Um so uh, now the abbey was meant to be the wood was meant to be next to the abbey and i want uh, we didn't have time to do a shot of coming out seeing the abbey through trees because it was pouring with rain and this was interesting because it rained and rained and rained and suddenly it stopped and i we were shooting inside the abbey and i said let's get it we rushed around it was like sort of it really was that cliche guerrilla filmmaking. I was saying, look here, look there. We were, do you remember this hurly yeah. burly? It was um, completely a manic. Because we had to get a lot of shots in order to convey the idea that she was, you mm. know, manically looking and she was yeah. slightly losing her her, her mind and uh, yeah. with worry. Um, this so is a lot to, what we were shooting while it was do. pouring with rain. So during this sequence, it's bucketing, bucketing outside. Um, our luck with the weather ran out. Um, it was absolutely torrential. You can see the mud beyond. Um, what are you doing here? I told you to go and find them all. I've done the young Walt, the young Christopher Lee, played by um, Sam, is um, Sam is um, the grandson of Stanley Kubrick. And if you look closely, you can see that, or even not that closely, you can see that he is um, looks rather like his grandfather. Um, it gave us a strange, slightly chilling performance. That gaze of a child um, who is sort of part of the family, but also um, with that ruthless stare that children have because it's not their responsibility. They're <laughs> doing what they've been told, um, playing a dark game, as it seems. And suddenly, having been um, this authority figure for the first 25 minutes of the film within the family, the eldest, her authority is draining away during the sequence, um, again because it's also interesting because she's a, she's an actress, which is obviously something I was very interested in. Mm. That that her status is very easily taken away from her because she can be defined very quickly as being a frivolous and uh, and and be you know dramatic or having a kind of um, overactive imagination, which I think you know it's it's. Uh, is obviously something that people can immediately kind of connect with you if you do that as a job and it works against her very kind of fiercely in, in this film. Yes, I mean the choice to make her um, an act, uh, being an actress was important because they were looked down upon, um, it's still in some quarters, but at that time it was thought of as a sort of frivolous and that they, and also that actors weren't very clever and so scatty flaky as we'd say now and this is of course why this has been engineered because she's been asking awkward questions um, to cast her as, as 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 a completely unreliable person um and it sort of works um and she can't conceive um who else could be responsible except the jeremy Norton. this is as again how jeremy's cast he works very well there because <laughs> um in that group of actors who do you suspect you certainly suspect jeremy Norton. um um, the Secret Service were an extremely powerful force 
um, at this time. Um, everything um, about this pressure being brought to bear on people like David Tennant's character is true. Um, and um, the, the monitoring of phone calls, the recording of phone calls, um, all Churchill's phone calls were, mo were, were listened into. Um, it completely, he was clearly unaware of it. His movements were monitored the whole time. Um, anybody against appeasement within Parliament was followed, spied upon by the Secret Service. Um, so all of this, um, I've heightened, obviously, um, the murders or not, as I may come to, um, I may not even exaggerate that, as evidence has come to fall since the film's been released. But nevertheless, um, all of this is true. Um, it's, um, and um, she has every right to um, ask awkward questions because something very strange has happened. And, you know, it's incredibly um, pertinent subject matter given the inquiry that we're finally getting on Iraq and that, you know, this country still has a slightly um, a confused relationship to the truth when it comes to its kind of foreign policy. Yes, I mean, it's interesting because um, there's a connection, obviously, uh, and one was a just war and one in most people's eyes now is an unjust war, but um, the Secret Service both times exaggerated the threat. I mean, Hitler wasn't as powerful as they made out. Um, um, especially at the time in Munich. Um, I mean, he was powerful, but um, he wasn't this unbeatable force that he became when he had the whole of Europe, or nearly unbeatable. Um, and um, they exaggerated the power of the Air Force um, enormously, um, the German Air Force. Um, that's why we gave away Munich. Um, and, of course, um, Iraq's threat was greatly exaggerated too. Um, here we have um, a, another cat. And why are the cats important? Well, they are obviously, as we get to the death of the animals later, an important part of the story. But also this enabled me, um, again, not for economic reasons. I really didn't want the film to be full of, of cars peep beeping in London exteriors. I wanted to be within the family. And so we cut from cat to cat. We cut the London, uh, go to London via a cat and this cold interior. Because um, when you're arriving back to your own house, you don't stare at the exterior, you know what it looks like. So uh, that's why a lot of British period films tend to sort of blend into each other, I think, sort of resemble each other. I'm trying to avoid that by this nifty cutting from cat to cat. It was a very difficult shot to get to the cat standing alone and on the, the And the sense that, you know, their home is not an extraordinary palatial exactly. place, that they're not, you know, that it's not a National Trust tour when they go mm. there. It's... Um, you know, it's something that they're very familiar and accustomed to, and um, it's one of my favourite scenes. I loved working with with Eddie. He is mm. an incredible actor. Um, he he was essentially holding a secret um, for the whole film, as as was Bill, um, which is a really really hard thing to do because you're. I suppose you're raised on Dutch as an actress to communicate. That's what what you want to do. You want to communicate what your your character is thinking and feeling, and to not do that, to hold something back from the audience for the whole of the film is 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 hard. And I think he does it incredibly well and powerfully. And it it takes modesty as an actor to do that, um, and and intelligence. And he was brilliant in this scene. I think. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I think that there's. Um um, the nonchalant um, 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 and genuine fondness that he has for her, yeah. and that that people, you know, there's no such thing as character. Can people can believe and feel many different things concurrently, and you believe that he is fond of her and does love her, and they, at the same time, are quite happy to dispose of her <laughs> if she is well, inconvenient to handle her. <laughs> yes, as 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 much as yes, um, stop her poking her nose in. But of course, she once um, she gets. Um, Obviously, um, she wants to know what's happening. I mean, it's her friend, um, her lover, um, has disappeared to, to, and you know she was friendly with Hector. So there's a strong case. She's going to have to find out what's happening. And I think it's interesting mm. that you know you've made her an, an actor as well, Stephen, because you know she has this uh, creative or, or uh, you know uh, heightened sense of imagination, which gives her this kind of curiosity. Which at the beginning of the film you think oh, could be kind of frivolous or self-indulgent, mm. but actually it turns out that her instincts are are are, are right, and and that you know it is a sinister environment that she's in. So here we have David Tennant. Um, 
he did this in a room of, um, well after f um, um, back in London when he came, <laughs> after his accident was playing Hamlet again and um, came in and did this just two takes I was very impressed this desperate screaming it's quite difficult to do that when you're parted from the character and uh, alone in a recording room and we were um, this is a particularly in a particularly small space looks slightly bigger on film but, um, and um, for the breaking of the record um, which actually looks rather convincing I was very it was, uh, bothered me that you know this mustn't seem like everybody even the maids in, in on it it got to look like a genuine accident um, and um, this is this was interesting too because um, we had two cameras and we shot this scene in one huge and the following scene with Eddie in one huge long take didn't we um, which um, yeah. um, oh, pointing one way and then the, the next take pointing the other. So. This is also my audition scene and I always find it really hard shooting mm. the scene that you've auditioned with <laughs> because yeah. um, you, you, when you prepare an audition scene you prepare it kind of in isolation to the rest of the script and, and you prep it almost like a song or something. It's mm. got no kind of wider reference. You're just trying to kind of communicate the character in one scene and when you actually come to shoot it that's not helpful. You don't want to tell everything about <laughs> your character in one scene. Um, mm. So um, yeah, you're both great in this scene, and um, it was cause we had an awful lot to do in this big interior. So this um, this was shot uh, within the same take. Then you walked in, and the other camera was waiting. Um, um, and um, I never done something like that before. And um, it's because the scenes were in real time next to each other. But um, we all liked it um, <laughs> because it, lay, it's, it helped us to um, keep the mood. So we had these huge long takes, um, which I generally like anyway. Um, I like the suspense of not doing hundreds of pickups, but long takes. And it gives a real mm. continuity in the mm. mood. I think you can tell, I mean, however much you try it, that mm. I think you can tell that me and Eddie ha are coming in from, you know, a, mm. a, a realistic um, background. We're not just sort of walking mm. into a scene. Uh, it's me and my huge dress. <laughs> yes, on the sound stage at Ealing, um, this, we seized the opportunity. The Descent Two was dismantling their set, and I suddenly thought that I'd written this scene in a passage, and I thought it would be great to see it oh, use a huge empty sound stage. So um, we beetled in oh, with Ealing Studios permission, I hasten to add, and um, shot in this empty sound stage. And um, we, I love wearing this this costume, this dress, and, and, and with Hugh as well, because it gives you a real sense of the kind of the way that the job of an actor can sometimes be such a bubble that mm. you could spend a period of your day essentially in sort of fancy, <laughs> fancy dress. Mm. <laughs> so now they're driving, I mean, in reality, um, her studio would probably have been Pinewood or Shepperton, almost only Pinewood, which was already a, a big studio in those days, um, in the 30s. Um, or Denham, um, which was outside, again, outside London. So to go to a stately home nearby um, in the country um, to pick up would not have been such a huge journey. Um, here we are. Um, actually, this is the one um, area where we are back in Norfolk, which is meant to be in London outskirts. We we're actually in the uh, Holcombe Estate, the great house in North Norfolk, um, uh, where some of the Duchess was filmed and where I shot some of the Lost Prince. So we were back, I was back in the same place. Um, and this was your first big scene. Um, well, it's the first yeah, it day, was, wasn't it? Um, second scene, because you'd done the, the film the set. afternoon of the first day. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's always suspense in, in filmmaking other than achieving the film. And one of the suspenses here was that Hugh, who I was delighted to have playing Gilbert, and I think he's brilliant as Gilbert. Um, I've never worked with him before, and it was great to work with him. There was one slight complication. He was going off um, to celebrate his wedding anniversary with his wife in Rome, and we had to get him on the plane um, by a certain time um, the following morning. And um, so... <laughs> Normally, you're not rushing to get a, um, an actor on the plane for a romantic weekend. You know, it's not one of the things you have to worry about. But So it was just an added pressure, um, apart from the light going at four o'clock and, um, you know, um, shooting in a car where you can't really hear the dialogue that well and all that. So it was an And also trying, uh, both, I remember me and Hugh talking about how that, you know, I, I'd never done a, a genre film before and communicating information isn't something that I'd necessarily ever 
really done before, and it was it was yes, it's, it's difficult. Inter- to well, do neither that. had I. I've never made a thriller before, so yes, it is interesting that I mean, but you need a scene um, um, whereby the character is asking questions that you, as an intelligent yeah, member of the audience, yeah. would want to ask, and she's got to find out um, um, what's happening. But also, she can't be politically tuned in; otherwise, she would, you know, wouldn't the story would not be reflective of the time because most of the people um, didn't understand what was happening in Europe because they had been very little reported what was going on with the, the persecution of the Jews. I mean, they knew Hitler was um, was a extremely... Nice. Um, yes, the, the dear... Visual uh, image of uh, the, 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 the balmy mm-hmm. Sunday. That was shot in, in, in October before we started the main shoot, as was that shot of... That is meant to be um, in... Uh, not in that is actually Holcomb for those of you who know your stately homes in North Norfolk but the interior um, we come to um, is this one is a place called um, I think it's called Clayton House um, um, it's in Buckinghamshire anyway it's near Stowe um, it's one of the few Rococo interiors in um, in Britain um, with this amazing staircase and here we have this image of all of these girls crashed out after a ball. Um, there were these incredible balls um, uh, on the eve of war, with the upper class, some of the greatest parts of the 20th century. Um, it was the great season, um, Deb season, one of the greatest, most um, indulgent, flamboyant seasons um, of the 20th century on the very moment that war was about declared and that's what I wanted to suggest in this image but I, I wouldn't even if we'd had a vast budget I wouldn't have staged the ball because then we were suddenly in a big period bright city sort of film I wanted the aftermath the sense of of of, of these people um, indolently sleeping um, unaware of the precipice that they're on and there's brilliant source material for the, that, that scene the, the photographs of people and mattresses in the mm. sort of grand hall of Britain's stately homes, Mm. a great sense of people sleeping their way (laughs) towards disaster. Yes, John F. Kennedy, um, uh, President Kennedy wrote his um, PhD thesis um, uh, because his father was ambassador, we'll come to that, um, British ambassador, American ambassador in Britain, Why England Slept. Um, was the title of his um, rather brilliant title of his dissertation and that is true a lot of them were sleeping towards war um, this is the interior this, this this lovely Rococo interior with this elaborate this is um, they're all um, this all wood that um, those carvings of flying birds and there is Julie um, up all night with the young people um, in this gorgeous interior frivolously seemingly carrying on um, regardless, um, but with just a tinge of darkness, um, you just feel that she um, she might know more than she's letting on, um, but um, not enough for hopefully to make Anne look stupid. Of course, it's her auntie as well. Why should she think anything other than uh, what she is, <laughs> which is a, a grand and slightly silly woman who um, has had a fantastically indulgent life. The life of the upper classes was never better than... In the on the eve of war, with all the servants running around for them, but also all the mod cons of the 20th century were now on stream: the telephone, hot water, um, the car, the wireless, everything that made their life even more pleasurable. So here we have the film within a film. This was the very first thing we shot, wasn't it? It was quite yeah. fun to start with this. And and Annie, the um, costume designer on the film, and I had a very early conversation about what I would be wearing, and I I said. I, I really want to be wearing an enormous bonnet and corset um, because it sort of epitomises for me the weirdness of of, of my mm. experience of, of acting. Um, yes, and it's yeah. true that, I mean, people were, if they were making films, I mean, if you read any the histories of British film, that people were making films in the Eve of War or during the war, in fact, were obsessed with the filmmaking process and, and hardly aware of what was happening because film is such an all-consuming thing and making a film because of the time and the hours that, I mean, it seemed particularly appropriate that she should be in the middle of a film when the um, 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 when um, war is declared. And, of course, it's also truthful when people, when you are on a film set, it's very, very difficult to take somebody away for a private moment and tell them what 
Hugh's got to tell you, which is you've got to listen to this record again, because if you're laying on the thoughts of people rushing you on, there were all these people around, and especially in their field, they would have to have gone you know, into the wood to have a private conversation. So it does... Um, get, it does also, get... you get a real sense of the danger of what he... You know, his, mm. his awareness of, of, of how dangerous mm. the territory that she's getting herself into Absolutely. is. Absolutely. She has to find a moment to tell him. That. But, of course, she suddenly the war's declared and that moment it becomes incredibly difficult to find. This this sequence was lit with the actual old lights that they would have used. Um, so um, the lights you see in the sh- um, are um, original film lights. So, and um, it was... It was um, um, even though it was a horrible, glum day, um, we, we were able to um, to to achieve uh, a nice look with with those original lights. So we return to the family home after her busy filmmaking day and the incredible news of the war breaking out, which even though people knew it was um, there was a huge crisis. Um, they did think that war, a lot of people would be averted as it had been the year before. And so the sense of comfort the family wants for her to read, um, uh, particularly, um, I think we all found this quite upsetting um, because we knew the story, um, her reading to the family and that the poised moment on the precipice. And then off she goes to work. And um, this is, again, Ealing Studios. It um, was built in the 1920s. Um, these Most of these... Um, um, our original the staircase and um, um, it was again absolutely freezing <laughs> um, and I love this section with the policemen that are extras yeah. from the <laughs> film and, and, and the real policemen the real yeah. policemen this was interesting because I shot everything that um, that you were looking at, and then I showed it to you what we'd shot, didn't I? Because mm-hmm. we didn't, and because um, we did this in huge long take, but um, it was um, it was um, there's just two shots in this sequence. Um, to, uh, it's all one shot. What you're looking at, even I mean, there are lots of images. My POV, and then yeah, yeah, back on, and, and on, I think that the... each. It's about 45 seconds, but each take took about six or seven minutes. But it was worth it because uh, you're extraordinarily um, upsetting in the sequences. And the, the the image just, you know, it's like in life, hopefully, that you've wandered in and you do not have a sense of dread, but you're not expecting to see what you see, of course. And um, I, Returning to the subject of the murders, I mean, in all the publicity of the film beforehand, I was saying, of course... Uh, I'm, the murderous f- conspiracy is fictitious. I'm not suggesting the Secret Service bump people off. But on the night this film opened in the West End, um, Romola Bill Nye and I did a Q&A, and afterwards it came out, the Odeon West End, into Leicester Square, and an old gentleman came up to me and said, my father worked for the Secret Service, and you've got it absolutely right. They were murderous bastards. Um, and then he disappeared into the night. I promise you, this is completely true. And it took me a moment. I was so surprised. And then he'd gone. And obviously, I think, how could I find this man and um, find out more about him? But um, um, I loved that idea that maybe um, um, they were, um, you know, that this obviously it is a heightening. Um, if I had proof, then it would be a, a huge historical scoop. But... Um, Secret Service were not the sort of relaxed, nonchalant um, gentleman animators that we might think from the great films of the 30s like The Lady Vanishes or Carol Reed's Night Train to Munich with Rex Harrison um, getting people out of um, Nazi Germany pretending to be what he isn't. Um, they were extremely well organised and maybe more, <laughs> more efficient than they are now. So that certainly is interesting and true. So... You search for your lover, um, um, and you, the shock, delayed shock almost, I think that's quite real, the shock goes on and on, and this hugely important scene with Bill. Um, What's really great uh, um, about the scene was that um, Bill and I had, had worked together before when I was um, much younger, and the very almost the very first job I ever did, and we had established a relationship of playing a father and daughter before, and I think um, his fondness for Anne 
is so palpable in, in this scene. It's extraordinary uh, that that you could have that kind of duality of feeling for your child, you know, a fondness and, and care and concern. and um, But obviously for his character, it was weighed against a sense of moral moral duty to keep Britain out of the war, which is all played out in, in the sort of subtext of the scene, which is why Bill's such an extraordinary actor. And also, of course, the shadow of the First World War, um, that he, because he was in um, the, the, the war, um, in, um, and had experienced the horror of the trenches, and that was um, uh, one of the reasons people um, were so keen not to stand up to Hitler. Um, although the overriding reason was what Bill says at the end of the film that um, to preserve their way of life, especially for the upper classes. Um, there's also a particularly gorgeous music cue um, 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 lurking under this scene um, from Adrian Johnson, um, somebody who I've worked with in all my work for the last 10 years, 12 years, um, once again has written a, an absolutely stunning score. And there's this um, romantic and plangent music underneath this scene which um, gives an added poignancy and depth, I think, to their relationship. I love you. No one knows what each day will bring at the moment, and that's very disconcerting. It applies to me as well. One thing is certain. We won't let Mr. Bull come anywhere near us. Whatever he's up to, I will keep you safe. There is the... Um ambiguity of course that where that Hugh whether Hugh's character Gilbert um shot himself because of um depression we know he's not very happy with his career and there were a lot of suicides at the beginning of the war people were really really beside themselves some and so um again it is plausible his explanation that maybe they're not connected how could they be connected really um um an actor and um you know a funny old actor and david tennant's character it doesn't seem that they could be connected really because she's sort of forgotten about the record which seems to me you would unless of the war breaking out then is there's a lovely um um speech that eddie gives here where he talks about about people seeing barrage balloons being inflated in the parks in London. Um, he talks about them being like a silver beast and I had a lovely letter from a um, a relative of mine, distant relative, where she talks about standing on the roof of the building. She worked for the War Ministry at the time, standing on the roof of the building and seeing those balloons being in, inflated her, herself and, and the sense that something sort of so abstract and extraordinary was invading their lives and that the, the city was becoming... A completely different animal, um, almost overnight, which um, which you really get, I think, in this scene, the way that people talk about for the first time the putting down of the pets, which is something I'd never even heard of until I read the script. Yes, I mean the pets will come to, but I mean the whole that was uh, I didn't know until I started one, researching this period. And one of the things that made me want to write the story was the extraordinary, extraordinary um, metaphor that was. Um, that everybody had their pets put down. What would have happened if the Germans had taken over the Nazis? Um, what happened in the rest of Europe would have happened here. Um, but we now, back in Ealing, um, this interestingly is the same set that we saw the dead Gilbert on a um, moment before. Um, we cleared that room because it, was, it is actually an old dubbing theatre, original dubbing theatre in Ealing Studios. And so um, we were then being totally historically accurate. This is where she would have dubbed her film. And um, um, it was bizarre, um, um, quite complicated shooting the scene because the film had to go run backwards and forwards and um, um, it required a lot of working out. Um, but is um, a, I think most filmmakers... Um, the enormous tedium of post-production when you're watching your film again and again <laughs> suddenly th you often do notice things that I mean that you never noticed before often um, um, a car parked in a shot or something where it's meant to be a period film that nobody's noticed before um, 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 but often you do fantasize that suddenly one of the characters might say something different than than you think they've said I, I have actually um, 
even that I write all my own material, um, sometimes it's latest dubbing that I realise that an actor said the wrong line. In fact, it happened in this film. I'm not going to name who the actor was, but it was very, very late that was I realised. Was it realized, me? No, it was certainly not you. Oh, um, that, that that said the wrong. Line. So, um, but here. Um, um, suddenly the director realises that he's said something different so I can promise you this is totally <laughs> can't happen that you haven't noticed it till this moment of course he's um, racing to try to finish the film early probably won't have cut it completely yet because so it's, it's more understandable even because the war's breaking out and, and they were shutting down all the cinemas things people were desperate to finish their films before they were stopped doing that of course, filmmaking didn't stop in the end. But um, what's lovely about about this as well is that you you know you found a way of of conveying a message from the grave, literally, and 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 it is extraordinary because you quite often do ADR a considerable amount of time after you shot a film, and then promotion can be anything up to two or three years after you've made a film, and you are sort of constantly being presented with your past and asked to talk about it and interact with it in a sort of endless cycle when you when you're an actor, and I think what's amazing is that you get a sense of of that her aspects of her job paralleling the um the world that she's she's experiencing at that time with people constantly being confronted with their 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 past hmm. he's great in that scene Hugh as well um yeah, speaking really from, powerful. so she returns to norfolk um and um um again um I sort of didn't do exteriors of the house, even though we had them, and we just go straight in there, and um, and here um, the the revelation that's coming. Um, I um, again had this idea quite early on that you know that she doesn't listen to this boring record all the way through, and so this, so she's missed um, them. Who would sit through a whole record of a meeting um, and? Um, one of the things that, I mean, Eddie puts on a record early on that she discovers, but of course, if he knew, he never chimed up towards, except right near the end of any of these meetings, um, then um, he He'd was safe. He, he had nothing As long as he was controlling the record and put it on at the beginning, he was safe. Um, the um, That's how I justify that. It's a slight liberty. All genre films, you have to take a slight liberty sometimes to um, to have set piece surprises but nevertheless I thought since he's controlling the record when he puts it on at the breakfast that seemed to me plausible I love that this is scene is, is in her childhood bedroom as mm. well because you have a sense of this kind of child in, inside this this woman um, mm. she certainly has a very kind of childlike or inf infantilised relationship with her father and I think there's a nice parallel with, with Britain at that time the sort of loss of mm. innocence mm. That, that happens in, in, in this scene with her kind of childhood drawings and pictures taped mm. up on the wall behind her this was a a, a great um, surprise to me I mean but though we'd rehearsed and rehearsed we hadn't actually rehearsed this moment of revelation and I had written her sort of stunned absolutely stunned like frozen but you did this which I think is great um, and I was surprised because I didn't know you were going to do it this very emotional response to it um, uh, which I think is was a great choice because uh, you know the audience wants you to be that upset I think because it is startling um, and um, um, and then you get frozen in this scene which follows when um, Julie's <laughs> going on and on about her party and um, these great hostesses um, one of these hostesses with the wonderful name of Emerald Cunard is real um, um, you have checks um, on scripts before you shoot even from the dead and I thought somebody's going to object to me using Emerald Cunard but they never did Emerald Cunard was a great hostess she was American um, and um, as of course was Nancy Astor one of the great appeasers Nancy Astor was also an Anglo-American um, but there were these enormously competitive hostesses and their parties did not stop um, and their tea parties and their dinners um, stopped because of the war um, they continued um, but um, um, this magic circle of these um, extremely powerful women um, having all the elite, both the political and aristocratic elite, in their houses and then thrashing out world events between them, that, that was how the country was run. And the slightly sort of tenuous relationship of women in this area before the war, because of course the war, you know, irrevocably changed the status of women in Britain, but, you know, at this time they're still occupying this kind of tenuous relationship of the kind of backseat of power that's exemplified by 
Julie in the film and then Anne sort of attempts to kind of involve herself in a more active way in this in the storyline and of course suffers a um, terrible repercussions as a result of that. Yes, that's absolutely right. Here we hear, see the radio and uh, the actual this is taken there's very little uh, recorded left of this time the phony war sadly but this this which i took from the opening days of the war that's on the radio about prime minister mr chamberlain about to make a speech um to the nation was, was an actual recording so now we're on the salt marshes of north norfolk um it looks like um, a wheat field or something but it's actually um that's um uh, um, those are th rushes, um, not rushes, and from rush, they're um, what <laughs> twine is made out of bull rushes, and um, uh, um, um, this is shot on very long lens. We had two cameras, um, one lurking amongst the bull rushes, and one on here. In fact, it was these. It's that brilliant moment in filming where you yeah. suddenly, when me and Julie were standing around chatting as you do, and you suddenly look around and you realise that you're standing in a landscape completely on your own. Yes. <laughs> in fact, everyone else is driven about 15 miles away. You have no idea where anyone is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this this strange Hitchcockian little man, essentially. Um, being Tim Spall's un, um, stand in on various films, I've worked a lot with Tim, so that was a nice connection. Um, that, this church is again in the salt marshes, um, lurking by the sea in North Norfolk. Um, and um, um, it's a scene that I think you're both great in that, um, uh, that she seems to be being nice, and suddenly she's horribly sort of cold, and sort of you feel her. Um, being allowed to be a member of a family this is the thing that she that that is such an incredible shock to her having been such a seemingly loved child suddenly her um being adopted and and being um it's you know um maybe not being treated as the other children is that that begins to become clear in the stories um first from the vicar and julie and then of course from her siblings and from Bill later in the story. It's in this scene, the most direct reference is made of how lucky she is to be a member of this family by this by the tactless vicar. Um who um I um, um tend not to try to write black and white characters and have it in for certain characters, but for some reason I did have it in for this vicar. Not for the actor, I might hasten to add, but for um, <laughs> this vicar. Maybe it's my upbringing as a Jewish, the only Jewish boy at an um, English boarding school, which was incredibly Anglican, um, and we went to chapel every day. Maybe this boiled up in this scene, the rage <laughs> at the indifference of the Anglican church to what was happening, but um, um, there were, of course, many brave exceptions to that, but um, there were many that were not that concerned. <laughs> um, so here is... Um, I, re I really love the beginning of this sequence um, because I think there's a really... There's a fantastic moment in all people where your suspicions... Or, or your concern that your suspicions of something will make you look insane, uh, overtaken by your fear. <laughs> mm. And suddenly, you know, she has to weigh up the kind of worry that people are going to think she's crazy with the realisation that, you know, she, she thinks she's right, that there's something really terrible is happening and it's a real moment of kind of mm. empowerment and fear. And uh, I love that she has a strong... She has a strong nature beneath all of the... Mm. Um, she uses yeah. her acting skill to get out of the church. And of course... <laughs> her acting yeah, skill, yeah. which at the time I remember you saying, a little less of the <laughs> coughing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit and, too much. And, um, again, you're running, uh, we were miles away, the camera, there's this very, very wide shot there, there um, showing how far we were away from you. Um, you um, the little, why is the man there? Because, of course, they know she's got a piece of evidence, uh, this record, that's why um, they didn't find, um, or she, and there, there it is. So if we're following logical Jean reasoning, um, they're keeping an eye on, also to know quite how much she knows, is she in touch with people? Um, the, um, as I say, this was happening, um, that um, on a, the people were followed all over the place um, who were thought to be um, a threat to national security um, before war was declared. Of course, now war has been declared, so it's even more valid in their eyes um, because there's even more at stake. 
they this was so much fun can i just say as well because, driving the car yeah also i didn't mention i'm not a brilliant driver <laughs> i really? didn't mention that to anybody i sure gave the impression <laughs> of being totally in command of this car um <laughs> This is um, this was all done for real, mowing down the <laughs> the, the maid. That's um, yeah, she just had to step out of the way. But um, and um, um, we were, she ran and ran. She was so fast. She kept on catching the car that made getting too close to it. Um, this was the very first things we did. These driving shots um, um, on the day we travelled down. We did a sort of first few hours of shooting. That was quite. Um, in this car which um you hurtle around the country and um yeah it was fantastic um it is um again with very little daylight it was quite elaborate this sequence and then we shot this later um the the truck menacing um i'd originally written this like when the truck passes her and then um turns around and then uh, overtakes her it had slightly more logic to it like the trucks um Going, but she thinks it's menacing her but it was too elaborate to stage that but nevertheless I think that she you know in the country people do drive very fast it's a very urban animal now I'm always stunned how people I'm always being menaced by people roaring out behind me in the country and um, so I think it's sort of it sort of makes sense from her eyes um, but of course it's real dramatic importance is because it leads her to be a bit lippy with the military police um, saying hey <laughs> what happened happened to that lorry <laughs> um, when they stop her. This was a ghastly day. You can see the mist closing in on those trees. Um, and we had to do this scene um, the, within a few minutes. It was raining. and um, My hair is naturally very, very straight. And, and I remember hair, hair and makeup, lovely hair and makeup team, desperately trying to create some semblance of a 40s sort of Marseille wave in my hair. And at one point, People just came up to me with tongs and just sort of throw their arms off and say, what's the <laughs> point? It's so it's so damp. Your hair yeah, yeah. is completely straight. It was, um, it was, this was really, really tough to do this sequence um, um, because of um, the rain was always threatening to descend. Um, the sort of thing that nobody ever cares about when they see a movie. And you know the time nobody's going to... Um, C congratulate you on achieving a sequence at the wrong time of year and in uh, and with with diabolical weather coming but um nevertheless there's a certain exhilaration when you get in the can even though you know no, no no audience will ever care that that was achieved under difficult circumstances Danny's or, so brilliant at shooting mm. those lines those parallel lines of Norfolk mm. the kind of mm. flatness of it as well as yeah as well. we carefully chose this so that we'd get a bit of uh you know um, isolation I mean um there was a strange um, rule at that time since abolished by Film East that you could only shoot on certain roads and not others because of the way that the money from the European Union is given for filmmaking in regions. So um, um, it's, part of this road was in the right region and part wasn't, so we had to be very careful where we shot sort of strange bureaucracy that pursues you as well as the weather. Now this was, I originally wrote this sequence in a village hall, but I realised and the idea that, you know, that uh, rural England was being taken over by the military. But um, I realised that that probably wouldn't read as dramatically as I wanted. And so we found this fantastic barn. Um, and um, there it is. It's, it's uh, as big as it looks. It's colossal and gives this feeling that I think um, on a more epic scale of the military taking over um it's so brilliant that the lighting in the scene is so impressive because these sort of the line of spots that descend down the sort of central aisle of the barn are so such a sense of interrogation and, and threat in that and Danny's so brilliant at, at having that as a sort of um, wash over this scene that it's yes this was um, 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 a, um, a big light but I mean it was um, a very pretty and um, it was um, chilling, chillingly acted um, by Anthony here on um, playing the military policeman. The um, um, a very good actor. The um, uh, truth about it that identity cards came in immediately in the war, and also um, the fact that um, um, 
the restrictions made. In fact, I think habeas corpus, I was corrected by a very knowledgeable journalist with one of the many interviews I did. I think habeas corpus was finally abolished by Winston Churchill. But what was true was that um, people were locked up without trial. Immediately the war started. You couldn't be detained um, for obvious reasons because they were worried uh, who might be an um, enemy agent. Um, all the time, um, Chamberlain and his cronies were planning to do a deal with Hitler to bring the war to an end before it had even started. The this siblings return. My favourite scene in the <laughs> yeah, film. Yeah. It's it's his... Juno is so brilliant. She's such a brilliant actress. It's, it's an amazing performance. The, yeah, well, this was the first, practically the first scene, Eddie and Juno, and um, Juno, I think, was very nervous. Um, but it was... Um, it is... Um, you know, she's trying to lie um, convincingly, um, and because she's an actress, again, that makes her hopefully she, you know, almost totally convincing. Although you feel that they are, um, they are possibly not completely believing her. Um, there is that sense of, um, of suddenly that the people closest to her, when she last saw them, it was in the garden, and they were being loving, and well, Juno had just thrown her arms around the sense of the loss of of Gilbert, the actor, had killed himself. Um, And now now they are potentially enemies. She can't quite work out how much Juno knows. And that's the audience position as well. Um, How much does Juno's character know? know? Um, But Eddie, we know, is implicated. And and, um, he is nonchalantly sort of... um, cruel here <laughs> this is sort of the sort of upper class joke that um, people still make you know meant to be funny that plenty more where you came from to the to the chauffeur uh, it's meant to be in his eyes affectionate but it has that it's got a lovely ring to it that line of yeah. the kind of legacy of the first world war as well yeah. not a great deal has changed in the minds of some people and yeah. the attitude to the um, middle classes and working class so we returned to London, and this was the interior of this house in St James's. Again, virtually never filmed in this extraordinary house. Rather hauntingly, straight across St James's Square from that, from this location was another huge house, which was Nancy Astor's house, the centre of appeasement in London, um, where Chamberlain would have come. Um, Geoffrey Dawson, the great appeaser, editor of the Times, all came to have dinner um, and plot their how we must stay out of the war. And they would have stared across the road to this house, um, to the very one we were filming in. So we were within a real stone's throw of where it all happened on the eve of war and during the war as well until Churchill became Prime Minister. Of course, none of the appeasers wanted Churchill to become Prime Minister. And then down amongst the childhood things, this um, was actually done in the stately home that um, Clayton House in Buckinghamshire uh, was their basement because of film scheduling and um, was your last scene. Yes, and and there's, a, again, it's lovely that the room is filled with their sort of childhood memorabilia, And but now the relics of their childhood have been confined to the basement as they're all kind of forced to leave their innocence and enter this kind of um, different part of, of, of the nation's life and, and, and their individual stories as well. Mm. And I loved working with Juno. She's an incredibly brilliant actress. And, and there was something about her, um, especially in that scene where she's really able to communicate the fact that, that um, you know, that she loves and values her sister, but that they see themselves as part of a larger scheme of their society mm. and class. And it's bigger than all of them. Yeah, and here she is entertaining. And the reference to um, Joseph Kennedy, the American ambassador in London, who is enormously of the belief that Britain was going to get completely smashed um, uh, by Hitler and that the Americans mustn't get involved at any cost. Um, um, One of the great appeasers, um, Joseph Kennedy. Um, And um, then we go down into what is meant to be the basement of the Foreign Office. Um, But this was shot in Somerset House. Um, And he's... um, rather wonderful basement. Um, immediately above us, the winter 
ice skaters were twirling around to Andrew Lloyd Webber and various tunes, and so it was very, very surreal. This we, is all ADR, is <laughs> Well, some of it, not all of it. Yeah, some of it is ADR, not, not, um, but um, it was it was very, very the, the extraordinary surrealism of filmmaking. Here we have this this. Um, 1939 basement of children's party at the foreign office and above the 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 21st century um skiers uh, skaters twirling around oblivious of our presence um and it is as um, amazing labyrinth um somerset house of course some of it is open to the public now but a lot of it is still government offices the inland revenue and even in this extraordinary period passage there are little brown doors which are still offices of people from the Inland Revenue. So it is, bizarrely, um, that 30s atmosphere has continued right to the present day in certain parts of this great... You do a good line in spooky children's parties. (laughs) (laughs) It's a terrifyingly (laughs) strange... Yeah, this is a sort of... um, Obviously, Hitchcock, um, the great genius of thrillers, is, is evoked, and it, with any suspense film, the sort of his name bands about. But he he did in his thirties films um, often have this contrast. Um, his thirties British films, especially, um, something slightly comic like a children's party, and then darkness happening at the same time. A film that you and I both watched, Young and Innocent, has a famous children's party, and not one of his best known films, um, but um, a brilliant film. Yeah, and. Um, Nova Pilbeam was, Nova the Pilbeam was the star, and we sort of modelled um, um, Anne on the slightly, you know, less successful Nova. You know, she might become as big as Nova, but you know, she's. A, but that was she was a sort of starlet at the time, and um, so here they is the lover returns, and we don't know um, where well, she trusts him implicitly, but I know she's right to. Um, there's a slight sense of is he involved as well as there always is in thrillers where you don't quite know who to trust. Um, and he tells her about the the conspiracy. Um, and this, of course, is true, that um, that there was a massive, massive pressure to bring the war even after it started to do a deal. And, of course, after right up to Dunkirk, after Dunkirk, Lord Halifax, the Foreign Secretary, wanted to do a deal with Hitler, which was basically, you can have the whole of Europe as long as you leave us alone and we can keep our empire. That was the deal they wanted to do. And they wanted to do it right up to, and became within a whisker of doing it, um, even after Churchill became Prime Minister, they wanted to do it. Um, And so none of us would, well, as we've said, we wouldn't be here. All sorts of people wouldn't be here if they'd succeeded. Um, So there were very, very high stakes. Um... Um, the um, um, the sort of suggesting the the the, the whole of Europe being con, uh, consumed um, by this crisis, um, uh, the war breaking out through um, these dispossessed in terms of not being able to go back to the countries possibly and not knowing whether they're staying in Britain or not um, through the Children's Party that seemed to me a good idea because it it suggested. Um, the whole of Europe um, in a very economical and slightly unexpected way. Um, and um, again, the sort of all-knowing eyes of these children who seem to know and not know at the same time um, is always dramatically, can be dramatically potent. And again, she's about to be left alone and um, she really doesn't want to be. Um, the um, Eddie's a rather good singer, isn't he? He was, He's a, got, he was a choral scholar. <laughs> yes, so yeah. we had a little bit of him singing just a moment ago. Um, and here's a very Bill moment. I mean, one you know, Bill's well known for his comedy. This, this always every public performance I've seen has got a big laugh. But um, about um, and it's good just to be reminded of that debonair, self-deprecating um, surface that um, is both. One of Bill's speciality, but also very English. Um, and then underneath, there's a much darker creation. Charlie and Eddie and Bill are all very charming in in real life, but but especially in in, in the film. And I think it's it's very powerful that you have a sense that to, to determine people's intentions is very difficult when they have that kind of implacable charm and ease and social ease, um, authority, and and 
and, and that's what makes it so hard for her to determine who is, you know, to all intents and purposes on her side or not. Um, but because they all have that kind of social ease and grace, mm. which she sort of loses through through the film, which I think is one of the things I was really interested in, is her kind of uh, sort of increasing humanity that she loses her kind of veneer um, through the film, which I liked. You see a personality coming out, which is a very strong and kind of a aggr slightly aggressive personality. Mm. That's right. Um, so here we have... Um, the big scene with Eddie, this is a scene that we rehearsed quite a lot, didn't we, in mm. the rehearsal room, and um, it was quite... Um, we ended up doing it in this tiny space. It was really small, this set, um, which was quite good, although very claustrophobic. Um, and it looked slightly bigger on film, but... Um, and um, I... Um, this was... Um, um, it was... It was a... A good, a good meaty scene to. Mm, um, it's a great scene to shoot um, with both of you, sort of really on song, um, and f your fabulous red dress. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant dress. <laughs> and um, uh, um, it's the, it's very hard when you do a scene like this to not want to emote because you know you, as I was saying, you, your your job is to communicate. And you're receiving a piece of information like you know the president of your adoption and. But I just remember you saying, "Don't do, don't do anything. Don't you know? Let her, let her hide it." And it was such a good note. And you see her strength in this, really, for mm. the first time. Well, she's trying to, um, yeah, make sure that her brother doesn't think he uh, um, that she's really frightened of him. There, you know, what he's up to um, underneath, or at least really disturbed is probably the right word yeah. about what he's up to. Um, somebody that she was uh, so close to, so in a matter of weeks before, days before, really. Um, and here we have the spooky young Walter again um, surfacing. This is the moment I felt most that I was in one of your films, <laughs> Stephen. This is such an iconic image, I think. Um, the, um, it was such a thrill. He's everything's happened in one day. I mean, he's, he cheekily says, "Well, you're here." So she says, "How can you possibly be here when you're in the church?" It's sort of how the audience thinks, because distance on film, you know, it's difficult. It's all happened in one day. Of course, Norfolk is only two. Hours. Even then, then there wasn't much traffic, so you would. And they drove like really fast, so you you would have been able to get from Norfolk to London in one day, and to get to this party late at night. But a lot has happened in this day. She's run away from the church. And she's been stopped by the military police, detained for a few hours, and then ended up at this party. I really, when I read the script for the first time before I auditioned, I remember that reading that scene when he says, "They don't love you." Yes. And the simplicity of that, and and it, the the fact that that has been the obvious kind of undercurrent from day one, just to have a character express it as simply as that, I thought was really was really powerful because um, it sort of. It was the first time that somebody very openly says, you know, how can you love and value something if you're prepared to dispose with it? Or, uh, And, of course, you know, that's the sort of running theme of the of the film in terms of what happened in Europe during the war as well with um, any vulnerable people. That's right. It is a pivotal moment when he says, they don't love you. He, as he says later, I warned you, says mm. the elder Chris. I did, I even warned it. He, he, he says, I even tried to warn her. So here we have um, her off to um, put the cat down. I mean, as I say, um, this was something that a lot of people were, and a great number of people were doing. In fact, the image was even more extraordinary than than what we see because if you're driven through London at that time from one end to the other, every high street, outside every vet, there was a pile of dead animals on the pavement as people walked past to post their letter or buy their bottle of milk. It was an extraordinary change of atmosphere from the great bulls and the heady summer to the whole of the city consumed by with dead animals in the streets as if that was the norm. Household pets that had been beloved huge barrage balloons and of course a mass evacuation about one and a half million people had been evacuated um why they put the pets down was because 
a lot of people were evacuated. There was nobody to look after them. Or also they weren't allowed to take them down to the bomb shelters. So, you know, they thought that was a humane thing to do. And also, you know, it's so fantastic because of it's what we're famous for as a nation is our obsession with and, and, and love of our domestic animals. And, and of course, <laughs> you know, they're the first thing to go. Yes, there they <laughs> are. Yes, I, the shot of the uncomprehending animal. And, of course, the children on the... Uh, most, a lot of the children had been evacuated, but not all of them. So there were little pockets of children left, sort of literally running wild, because the clues, uh, schools were shut, as she's just said. Um, and here they are um, putting their pets down. Um, this would be a scene that, as I say, would have been replicated all over London and in other cities in Britain. I love the sequence because of its, it's such a clever way of, of intimating the horror and bureaucracy of what was to happen in, in Germany and across Europe with the Holocaust and, 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 and a sense that of how, of course, Britain would have been capable of it, you know, just as everybody else was. And, and uh, you, you know, to, to have a sense of that in, in, in the sequence with the animals, I think is really, it was always really interesting to me. Yes, exactly. The bureaucracy and, and the, the sort of matter-of-factness of doing it was um, um, uh, well, it has terrible foreshadowing of what might have happened, as you say. Why would we have been different to the rest of Europe? We wouldn't have been. And um, um, that is what hopefully is quite chilling about this and the fact that also she is caught up having to meet her lover suddenly she finds herself unable to you know she has to try to find him and then the vet says come along and but she's determined not to have the cats put down so it, it's a very human predicament as well showing her humanity and um all those scenes with the cats early on pay off <laughs> i also remember lots of great conversations with absolutely brilliant hair and makeup designer Jenny about maybe she should start to get you know physically ruffled and you should start to see a kind of her psychological deterioration represented physically and of course now when I watch the film I think oh I'm so glad we don't see her <laughs> psychological deterioration represented physically that's such a nice hat <laughs> yes no well I, <laughs> you, the, that doesn't re oh, well we see that at, when you're locked up in the room so yeah. I think we, we do right get there the end of we the do film. get there yeah. she doesn't remain immaculate all the way through <laughs> but of course she would have done because people took great pride in uh, yeah especially somebody up. who did yeah. her job yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, um, would have taken trouble over her appearance all the time, yeah. So um, you're reasonably tall, Romola, but Richard Cordery who was playing the vet is enormously tall and um, dwarfs, dwarfs you. You're reduced to a small <laughs> person here. He's the tallest I've ever seen. He's really good. Because he's quite benign, and obviously, but um, you do feel um, that he might... You know, both involved. him and Suzanne Burden, who played the receptionist, are incredibly powerful in, in this section because they, again, just absolutely give the sense of being um, professional and uh, sort of, you know, slightly weighed down with bureaucracy and it all being a bit of a bore and absolutely <laughs> no sense that there's a kind of horrific <laughs> kind of death taking place of these animals, these beloved family pets being that's, yes, that's right. taken to be killed. The, the, um, the amazing... Um, the systems taking over. I mean, a Canadian gen, um, diplomat wrote about the f opening weeks of the war. You, sh you sure know what fascism would be like under Britain, <laughs> um, British fascism. And that was in the first few weeks of war, when you do get a whiff of that at the vets. People who do love to organise whatever they're organising, including the death. That these weren't real horses. Uh, they were good there. I remember you coming in and thinking, oh, God, they're real yeah, horses. Yeah, it gave me a real, a real shock. It was, but, they were incredibly brilliant. This is great, such a thing, amazing. Yeah, if you turn them over, they were sort of ha like hairy carpets on the other side. So, <laughs> um, so those were not dead horses, um, but they do look good. Um, and um, most of these bags, of course, are full of um, just old newspapers and stuff. It was but a this, very spooky set, though. It was, it was a spooky set. Um um, it was one of the central images of the script when I uh, visited the story. It was always leading to this because the animals was, was, as we've said, such an extraordinarily um, potent metaphor when I discovered that that's what had happened. Um, and this was shot at night as well because it was dark outside. We made it even more eerie. Um, and um, 
Charlie's really hanging upside down. That's really Charlie. That, um, um, and um, we only had time to do a few takes before the blood <laughs> to run into his Poor head. Poor guy, if you do that for more than a, yeah, a minute, the, you just pass out. Yeah, yeah, no, I was, when I wrote it, I thought, oh God, I hope we can stay. But actually, it was relatively simple. Um, and um, um, yeah, we obviously had health, health and safety and all that sort of around stunt people and everything you, you know no, nothing like that can be done without a lot of people around because it isn't safe unless you have that to hang people but he was very well I wouldn't say relaxed about it but he was very good about it Charlie and um but it was that was an upsetting sequence and it's great um, this with the clock tower and 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 the gates yeah this, uh, I found this, this all eerie, very hard to eerie Auschwitz shoot. like um yeah. this is actually um uh, a rather wonderful place in Merton, in near Wimbledon, um, belonging to the National Trust. So if you're in that area, I do suggest it, a visit. It's open to the public. It's an old mill um, with this, all the water running through. And um, this is actually their library. They have a little library or old bookshop there that we cleared out, this little cottage, because I like this homely cottage. It's like a terrible dark side of Dr. Doolittle. Instead of <laughs> making, listening to the animals talk, they're actually killing them. But, you know, I, that's, I, it's that side of England, the quaint um, animal doctor becomes an angel of death. And um, the, so there, this is the... the, the um, the the part of this area which is all over to the public in Merton and is ringed with um, suburban houses and it is meant to be in the suburbs of London so it's the sort of the correct place she's gone out there at, at his suggestion so they're away from like the vet round the corner from St James's um, where they could have easily been followed I remember having really interesting conversations with you at, at this time about how agitated she becomes at the end of the film because of course you know only somebody who's M you know, out of step with the rest of society is is happy to to sort of see horror and brutality where other people don't or, or is capable of seeing it and and that in a way is a kind of madness you know she is losing her mind but also in that you know she is 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 seeing horror and truth where other people um, mm. aren't and um, to get that balance right so that the audience goes on that journey with her and isn't alienated from her was quite was quite hard no, it's, yeah it's absolutely it's a, it was an incredibly demanding role and you're in every single shot I mean absolutely every single shot you're I mean every scene you're in absolutely every single scene um, the um, the little girl that appears um, possibly a tiny bit too neat but it's one of the children that's not at school because there were no schools they were shut down at that time they reopened a bit later and um then here comes Suzanne Dry and um there's the suddenly Bill and you sort of know my god what's my dad doing here um there were burning animals on pyres um um and so this is um, this is what was happening um how they got rid of all the dead animals um it must have been an extraordinary, surreal sight. And again, sort of <laughs> totally um, in another sort of place, <laughs> Suzanne um's character. Um, and uh, 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 the um, incongruity of 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 them and this um, scene again we were right we were well into um, December now I think when we were shooting this scene um, but fortunately it, I've written them sitting on the grass because um, and thank God you were able to. Again, snow was <laughs> about to appear, yeah, or had snowed actually that winter in October before you started. If you're in a heightened state of emotional, um, yeah, uh, uh, of being very emotional, then it's quite how, it's quite useful for it to be extremely cold yeah. um, but, um, and, and uncomfortable. It's, it's only when you're supposed to be looking like you're having a lovely time. That it's, yes, it's, this is true. Um, I mean, it's meant to be now. Time's moved on from the picnic, obviously, so um, we are meant to be in late autumn. But it's, just, it's only a few weeks out. Really, the scenes doesn't matter. It looking wintry now. It's just, um, but I, um, this uh, it, it is um, uh, um, something quite satisfying about that, that you know being on the ground as if they'd gone into a little room it would have seemed much more cozy but then the fourth and the fact is that 
um she doesn't know what to think but she suspects her dad now and it's it's but or, or she takes the string i mean this is the only uh, again this was a huge um for all my career writing all sorts of things um without not in genres to have somebody being given a drug drink is is quite a sort of departure for me but um and um it is it is if you think of all the details of the film the dead animals on bonfires what she's seen the murder of her lover the smoke coming out in a sort of auschwitz like way and the the, the building behind it is the components of the scene are are are, are are very um, extreme, um, but uh, something very um, Bill and your acting it, it does make you believe it. And um, as I say, apart from the drug drink, that is what was happening. Um, and there was um, much um, secret planning amongst people trying to um, keep lines open to the Nazis, so that we didn't um, fight the war, even though we were officially at war. Um, here she is in a, um, recovering from what she oh, um, has been given and um, in a sense one of the great templates for this film was um, one of my favourite films, Rosemary's Baby, and that's a little reference, The Knitting at the Bed, which anybody knows that film when she's confined at the, <laughs> to her bedroom at the end, there's people knitting, waiting for the baby to come out. Um, it's the sense of uh, a young woman in every scene and uh, not knowing whether the people around her are in, close to her involved or not that was a reference um, and also that uh, people's love for you is dependent on your usefulness exactly, it's, it's exactly. Sort of the great thing about using it, Rosemary's Day, Baby is that it, it's a great film about women and the, the vassals you know they're mm. just being vassals and and um, and that, to have a sense of that in, in this film as well that she's she is purely an object of, of of decoration and 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 if she can no longer kind of hold up what they are supposed to represent societally and and then she she can't be part of their family mm. anymore she wakes um from the dream that started the film so that's where it connects up the dream that, um and we see the rest of it there that her brother's betrayal and and then the spooky lady who's probably just trying to give her a cushion, but she is very frightening, but also keeping her terrorised, in a sense, so she's malleable. Um, and um, um, there is um, um, a um, um, real dislocation here um, for, you know, hopefully, if you're with the story, you completely become her here, that, you know, there's... Nice Bill, surely he is going to be revealed as nice in the end. You know, you really want him to be. And so I shot him really at a distance because, I mean, it's quite a pivotal speech he has, but I kept him at a distance because he has his other big scene coming up and I didn't want him to have, as it were, two arias so close together. But, I mean, in the sense, um, there is a... Um, I like that effect on the... Is that the bottle top thing? You put on the camera no actually because um the, the, this is the lens that makes it go all um um in and out of focus has the incredibly unromantic name of lens baby and um <laughs> we actually because there was a rescheduling here slightly and we were going to do your big shouting scene but then we rescheduled it we didn't have the lens baby so we originally did it with a lens passing a lens another lens across the screen that looked rather crude so we did this in post because i shot it um without that effect as well um and it's very it's actually very effective um so st paul's the, the image of st paul's that you know st paul's the heroic st paul's that um that withstood the blitz and which we've seen in a photo I'm about to see again um in the, but, but below st paul's dome in this house these dark events were happening that was the idea the importance of such an iconic building st paul's being featured the story so here's Spooky Jeremy um, 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 again. And um, this is another choice you made in the film that I was very thrilled about, which I wasn't expecting despite all our rehearsal, um, was that you refuse to look at him until um, until you do look at him. You look at him and then you look um, early on in the scene um, um, till that moment, in fact. And I found that such a great choice. Like, I will not accept even... Um, give the time of day to these accusations about my father, even though you suspect them um, yourself to hear it from him, because 
I can't bear the idea of you, of him being connected with you, and him, you know, and um, that was extraordinary. I think what's great about about the realization that she she is forced to accept in this moment mm. is that you know, like all great suspense stories that are based in sort of universal psychological um, truths and, and 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 fears, it's obvious from the start what's going on if you're mm. if you're if you can see it mm. and if you're prepared to accept the fact that those closest to you could mm. do you terrible harm. But of course, you know, in order to live and be happy, we, that's the one thing that people can never accept, you know, that, mm. that, that the people that are closest to you can can turn at any second or, or you are disposable to them. And so, you know, that's what's so hard for her to, to see and accept and for, in fact, anyone in an audience to see and accept. Yeah, I know, that's true because a lot of people and all these... Q and A's I've done around the country with this film that um, a lot of people come up and said I really didn't expect Bill Nye to be like that. I mean, mm. You know that's I really that was a terrible shock that really worked. You know so that though they aren't ahead of her because um, we they share the mm. they share the deception that she has as any anyone mm. in an audience would be. You know because it's horrific to to think that your your you know your loved ones your father your family could turn yeah. in that way. That's right. There's there's some Paul's picture, and um, we return to the the old uh, people, the old water and the baby that has grown up, um, to um, to um, um, and the reason for that was because you think, oh uh, my God, you know they know it's to prepare us for the end of the film, but also um, could she have been killed? In a sense, if we hadn't. Um, um, return to there. You would. You wouldn't have that uh, terrible feeling. This might not end well. I mean, it's when I haven't seen this film for a while. When I saw it again, having not seen it for a while, um, it is. You are just because they are close to her. You. You feel. Hang on a moment. This isn't. This. Whatever happens, this isn't going to work out mm. well for her because either she escapes somehow, but it's still her family, and that's what gives it its 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 real darkness here. I think, but it had to be dark because to dramatise what an incredibly close run thing it was, that the forces of darkness did not win, and by which I mean not the devil. It wasn't Satan. It was reasonable people like Bill, feeling they had to make this choice that we must not risk everything by standing up to Hitler. We mustn't do that because um, uh, we will be destroyed and everything that I value and believe in, my, my, my country, my home, my real children, the people that matter um, will be destroyed because um, basically the elite, the political and the aristocracy the elite were far more worried about communism than they were about fascism. Um, we had a great. I sort of remember we having conversations about whether or not Jeremy or Joseph Balkan would leave his cigarette case there, mm. and whether it was good or not mm. to have ambiguity about whether or not he's actually mm. been there. Um, but I, of course, because it's my character, I'm quite pleased that it was <laughs> obvious that he had been there, and that yes, he's not I'm, completely see, mad. Yes, I mean the, the fact that you know she's highly obviously in a highly strong state at the moment it's important that that everybody's telling her she's imagining it but she isn't and i think that yeah, as an audience you need you know the these events clearly are real and um they are um the what makes them so um um viscerally dark and upsetting um to her and hopefully the audience is because it is her family i mean it could be that that she just stumbled on a, a, a conspiracy and her family didn't believe her. That's the more tradition. No, she's... But in fact, um, and then they're all reunited at the end, happy ending. But um, that would be a much more traditional structure. But this is um, <laughs> embedded in her family. And that's... Bill is great in this speech. It's terrifying, but quite humane speech at the same time. It's, you know, he thinks. He's saying we're keeping you safe. In other words, keeping you from being polished off by the Secret Service by having you locked up. That is the logical thing to do, to try to contain her, since they can't have in the London house, because um, their the big house, St James's Square, because they're using that for meetings, can't have her banging on the door, hurtling around the house, <laughs> screaming, what are you doing? And you kill David Tennant and Hugh Bonneville. <laughs> you, 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 so she has to be put in this, you know, but also handing her over to Jeremy Northam is not a not option either, really, you know. 
allowing him to come and try to put the frighteners on her and tell her to be quiet and, um, is something that he obviously asked and insisted on doing. But And Jenny, um, to me, um, Jenny's character is... Um, why she doesn't she say anything? She's always clipping the razors because a lot of upper class women um, did lead very separate lives. Their husbands were often philanderers, leading especially in the political class like Bill is in, um, had double lives, a great deal of them had that. And she just checks out into her own world, you know, and seems to me quite truthful. Here is when the appalling image to you of them all quite talking, quite, not exactly merrily, but, you know, about controlling you and the fact that... Um, uh, um, and you start your outburst. This was a difficult thing to do, wasn't it? Yeah, put, how, choosing how to, to play this speech was I found really hard. Um... You will not bring that ghastly... But, it, yeah, it is difficult because it is... But, um, it's, uh, you know, it's... But people have been very grateful. Um, um, again, around the Q&A, people say, oh, I love that bit when she really shouted at them. You know, that the people like the fact she fights back. It was very, very important that she um, fought back. Um, and um, um, I think when you saw the film, you were quite surprised that I kept it all in. It was the most actressy thing I've ever said in my life, <laughs> is that I saw this film, which I was so proud to be in, and I said, oh, thank you, and thank you, Stephen, for letting me be in. Why did you play that, that scene at the end, all in a long shot? <laughs> well, because I think it's a principle that when people are shouting, stuff, you know, I always saw it in, in a wide shot. Um, the only difference was that I made it very bright. When I wrote it, I thought it should be dark and shadowy. But in fact, we have this idea of using this vivid stock to give it this, this really... No, I like that there's uh, a bright... Light There's a bright light, and she's sort of, and it, it it's it's quite bold, um, but I always saw you know uh, that she is she's suddenly for the audience she's a bit of a stranger as well you know you have to reach for her as it were in this scene, and um, uh, I, it's a general principle I think it's good when people shout on screen or cry on screen that that they're often in wide shot whenever I have people crying I often shoot them wide because again you need to reach for it as an audience um, and then it becomes more upsetting it is very you know dismissive there frightening because he says you know it's why you, you thought you knew everything you knew nothing um why don't you always just get i told you to get on with your life in other words be an actress <laughs> just get on with making your b pictures and mm -hmm. um it, that is incredibly hurtful there's another um lovely music cue here um aliens um this faraway horn and the sort of reclaiming of she begins to think back to the memory of that, the siblings, of how happy they were. And of course her dad as well. I'll never let you go away again. It's a lovely shot to you, I think, that, that particularly is a gorgeous, gorgeous shot. Um, the, um, yeah, uh, Danny is... Very the, kind to me. The, 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 <laughs> keep on making yourself deprecating remarks. Um, it's a remarkable performance that you give in this in this film, and I was so thrilled to see it happen in front of me. It was really, really exciting. The um, this everything to do with cats was impossible. Getting the cats <laughs> up to the window was an interesting challenge. It's nice though um, um, that of course cats find their way back to their territory, and it, this is. Julie Christie's cat, so it is returned to St Paul's. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. There are often stories of cats, of adult cats and dogs, of course, crossing cities, and um, it would have been particularly possible at that time because there were not very many animals for it to encounter, to get into fights with um, rival cats. Um, your desolation, um, see your lowest point. Um, are you going to give up? But there's a sort of defiance there. For me, you, um, your spirit is like the spirit of all those that uh, were determined to stand up to evil. I think the the speech where she really loses loses it with them. You know, she sort of embraces the kind of the acceptance that they 
they are prepared to do this to her and have done and the sort of that realization is a very freeing and liberating thing for her character she has this kind of inner burning strength that is able to 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 kind of be released after that realization the kind of horror of it is kind of liberating yes that's uh, um she f yeah she she knows she has no alternative um but to despise what they stand for which is a terrible emotional thing to realize to me this scene is what britain would have been like if we had done a deal with hitler that people um the the wanted people that were going to be rounded up and killed would have been told by their nearest um friends to get the hell out of there as quick as can and that's her mum lets her go and I really a yeary feeling came over this could have been what happened to my mum um it may seem extreme running around the, the street in um your um underwear but um that's what happened to people in Vienna they were suddenly thrown out of the houses forced to lick their pavement in their nightdress or their pajamas torn off trains and undressed in the street within hours of the, the of the nazis walking into vienna um so this is what happened in europe and would have happened here and we i felt i had to be really bold to suggest that at the end this is what would have happened and it's within living memory christopher lee was there <laughs> as um you know it's extraordinary to think how recent this was so the family um assembled um playing with um other children with the ambassador's children and um um and i really wanted again that's look going back to the jean to rosemary's baby if you like um you feel maybe she's going to go back there you feel this terrible sense of of possible um that she's going to disappoint you that she's going to but of course it's her family you know and um why doesn't she just run away because it's a huge emotional thing not to and they look so happy yeah. and it's a pull mm. it is a it is a choice it's not inevitable i think at the beginning of the scene that she will yeah but i think on balance what's nice about it is that that's a, yeah it's a great shot of you and you certainly look different there <laughs> they 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 said the 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 credible anguish on your face of the decision to go and then uh, I'm proud of this moment because it's it's sort of defeat turned into triumph she's running away but it's a triumphant moment supported by Adrian's score um why don't they run after her well she has no evidence um as has been said but also the secret service could easily f find her you know they're sort of watching the hands of her you know she's turned her back on the family you know and um I imagine her rushing to one of her actor's friends and sort of in the the flat in Cromwell Road or something, rushing up and saying, hide me, hide me, you know, and that sort of disbelieving friend that this possibly could have happened. And here we go back to the the, the present with the, the childhood drawings on their wall, her, her, her comic nights and um, them completely trapped by the past. They've never been able to be free of it, even though one of them was only a baby. I, I like that idea that though they were, well, one was a, a witness and the other was a, a bit of a participant because he did, you know, he's 14, he, he, he possibly should have questioned his motives, but it's difficult, especially at that time when you did what the, your, the elders, adults told you to do, you did them, that's him being encouraged to take um, the baby. It's a great idea of, of Balkans, Jeremy Northern, because if she woke up, he'd just say, "Oh, they want her at the. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they want the. They decided to have the baby with them in the wood." So I mean, it's much better than Jeremy Northern doing it. So, um, but if she doesn't wake up, it works, and as it did, so um, that's why he used the boy, and um, it's um, you know to get him to play a game that a game that stayed with them for the whole of their lives. Um, sort of ruined their lives but it's it, because they never free the darkness of the family and there will be families in this country that those um had a rather disgraceful record on the run-up to war their um incredible amount of anti-semitism amongst the upper classes we've brushed that all away now nobody ever talks about it or says of course everybody was anti-semitic then as if that was excuse which isn't true either um and um 
the reason we haven't really talked about that that she is not a Jew in the film, but she's and she's a, a a gypsy is because as a reminder that it wasn't just the Jews that would have been vulnerable; it would have been all sorts of people as and that were thought undesirable, um, as happened the rest of Europe, if they had um, if we'd become a puppet state. So they return to the um, to the um, that churchyard that you stared at. Um, this churchyard is in Stepney. It's um, um, the bells of this church are the ones that are mentioned in the nursery rhyme "Oranges and Lemons." The bells of St Clement, I think, I've got that right. Um, it's an incredibly um, old church, um, and um, what's rather haunting is that. There are fragments of old houses around it, which we saw behind you when you were staring at the railings, but everywhere else was completely flattened by the blitz. So um, the scars of the war of standing up to it... Writ or, large. Or writ large in this very landscape. Um, that's an isolated piece of medieval London left... Um, Muriel um, Pavlov, of course. Yes. Who's would have been a 30s... Yeah, Muriel was, a was starlet herself. Well, she became a star after the war. She was yeah, but um, she was in um, one of the most famous British war films, *Reach for the Sky*. She played Kenneth Moore's girlfriend in that, and of course she played the, in the opposite Dirk Bogard in the Doctor's films, and and also another famous British war film, um, *The Malta Story*, with uh, Alec Guinness, an Ealing's war film. So um, another link to our cinema past. Uh, Muriel was very much around. Um, she's about the same age as. Um, Christopher, um, when this story was happening, and so she remembers what the atmosphere was like. It's you know, a link, a link to that time, witnesses from that time, and of course, the fact that she survived both gives us, um, uh, hopefully, a, a feeling of. Well, I didn't want to end it on desolation. I wanted it to, that there were people, obviously, that stood up. And this image of you staring, both triumphant because you have survived, but also a question, you know, in your eyes, slight accusation. Yes, it was an incredibly close-run thing that we are here, that we did do that. And um, I think that's um, it's a great look you give at the end. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I just um, can't we I did was, that quite quickly, didn't I, we? D yeah. I remember saying, what do you want me to do? And you said, just look down the lens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> look straight in the lens. That questioning look, that look of, um, of um, yes, it was that recent and that close is what that look says at the end, I think. And I, I think that, um, um, I think there is a sort of, for both of us, maybe because of our, our, our um, European blood and background, um, uh, an element of passion and anger in the film, an anger that um, it was such a close run thing um, because um, um, it was obvious to a lot of people, including, of course, Churchill, um, that, um, you know, dealing with, trying to deal with Hitler was madness. Um, um, and um, one of the great, extraordinary, unanswered questions, well, if if only of history, is that if we'd stood up to Hitler at the time of Munich, a year before these events, um, his, most uh, um, historians seem to think, um, the consensus at this present moment amongst historians, is that if we'd stood up to Hitler at the time of Munich, he would have been toppled by a military coup because the army did not want to definitely did not want to go to war at that stage and there was um nor did the german people um in which case um between 30 and 50 million lives would have been saved um there would have been no second world war no holocaust i mean i i think what was so emotionally involving for me in making making this film and and, and working with you was that you know i was born in 1982 and Britain's national identity is so caught up with the role that we played in 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 the war after we did enter and it had begun, you know, in, in the Churchill years, in the true sense of the word, people, you know, threw themselves into defending Britain and, and Europe in a, in, a, in a noble and, you know, sacrificed huge amounts and, and that was such a incredible um, courage and, and bravery. But, but it's never... Um, been I think really addressed in this country what 
what happened in the years leading up to, you know, in the Spanish Civil War, the role that Britain took because of the fear of communism with aiding and abetting the fascists in Spain and, 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 and how unwilling they were to go to war for the plight of, of, of people in, in, another, in another country, in a faraway place. And, and um, I'm not sure that that is as, as represented as it should be uh, in our national identity when we think about ourselves as Britain. We should also think about that as well. Yes, I think that's right. I think that um, it is good to be... Um, hopefully, this is an exciting story and an emotional story, but it's, um, for me, it was very, very important um, not taking anything away from the heroic history that we had stood alone um, against fascism in 1940, but it is incredibly important for us to realise um, that it could so easily, so easily have been different, and then what would the world have look like and it, and again the events are so very recent so thank you very much Romola thank you Stephen for reliving the film with me thank you <laughs> thanks